Hello friends, today we are going to learn about endogenous growth theory. We will try to understand the loopholes in solo model. However, our focus is to understand the three main endogenous growth theory and to understand their implications, features and criticisms. So let us start with introduction. The endogenous growth theory was developed as a solution to the deficiency present in the solo model. It is a new theory which explains the long run growth rate of an economy on the basis of endogenous factors as against exogenous factors of the neoclassical growth theory. Endogenous growth can be explained that policies, internal processes and investment capital are important factors affecting economic growth rather than external factors. The solo model explains the long run growth rate of output based on two exogenous variables that are the rate of population growth and the rate of technological progress. Both variables are being independent of the saving rate. In the neoclassical theory, the long run growth rate depends on exogenous factors, hence it has few policy implications such as the government policy does not really matters as this theory depends on exogenous technical change and exogenous population growth. The new growth theory hence is an extension of the neoclassical growth theory introducing endogenous technical progress in growth models. The endogenous growth models are majorly developed by three economists namely Aero, Romer and Lucas. We will study the model given by these three economists by observing their main features, criticisms and policy implications. So friends, our next topic is the endogenous growth models. The endogenous growth models emphasize technical progress resulting from the rate of investment, the size of the capital stock and the stock of human capital. The new growth theories are based on some assumptions. Firstly, there are many firms in a market. Secondly, knowledge or technological advance is a non-rivalry. Third, there are increasing returns to scale to all factors taken together, whereas constant returns to scale if single factor is applied. Fourth, technological advance comes from new creation that people do. Fifth, market leaders have market power and thus they earn profits from their discoveries. These assumption arises from increasing returns to scale in production that leads to imperfect competition. As a matter of fact, these are the requirements of an endogenous growth theory. Given these assumptions, we explain the three main models of endogenous growth. So friends, let us now learn the Aero model. Aero was the first economist to introduce the concept of learning regarding it as endogenous in the growth process. His hypothesis was that at any moment of time, if new capital goods is built with all the available knowledge, particularly based on accumulated experience, then their productive deficiencies cannot be changed by subsequent learning. Arrow's model can be represented as yi equals to ak into function of ki and li, where yi denotes output of firm i, ki denotes its stock of capital, li denotes its stock of labor, k without a subscript denotes the aggregated stock of capital and a is the technology factor. He showed that if the stock of labor is held constant, growth ultimately comes to a halt because socially very little is invested and produced. Therefore, Aero did not explain that his model could lead to sustained endogenous growth. Friends, let us learn the second model that is the Lucas model. Uzawa 
developed an endogenous growth model based on investment in human capital which was used by Lucas. It was assumed by Lucas that investment on education leads to the production of human capital as it is crucial determinant in the growth process. He makes a distinction between the internal effects of human capital where the individual worker who is undergoing a training becomes more productive and external effects which spill over and increase the productivity of capital and of other workers in the economy. It is investment in human capital rather than physical capital that have spillover effects that increase the level of technology. Thus, the output for firm I take the form as shown yi equals to a into ki into hi into h exponential where a is the technical coefficient, ki and hi are the inputs of physical and human capital used by the firms to produce goods yi. The variable h exponential is the economy's average level of human capital representing the strength of the external effects from human capital to each firm's productivity. In the Lucas model, each firm faces constant returns to scale while there are increasing returns for the whole economy. Further, learning by doing or on-the-job training and spillover effects involve human capital. Each firm benefits from the average level of human capital in the economy rather than from the aggregate of human capital. Thus, it is not the accumulated knowledge or experience of other firms but the average level of skills and knowledge in the economy that are crucial for economic growth. In the model, technology is endogenously provided as a side effect of investment decisions by firms. Technology is treated as a public good from the viewpoint of its users. As a result, firms can be treated as price takers and there can be equilibrium with many firms as under perfect competition. So friends, now we'll move to the next model that is the Roma model. Roma in his paper on endogenous growth presented a variant on Arrow's model which is known as learning by investment. He assumes creation of knowledge as a side product of investment. He takes knowledge as an input in the production function as presented here that is y equals to ar into function of ri, ki and li where y is aggregate output, a is the public stock of knowledge from research and development r, ri is the stock of results from expenditure on research and development by firm I and KI and LI are capital stock and labor stock of firm I respectively. He assumes the function F homogeneous of degree 1 in all its inputs that is RI, KI and LI and treats RI as a rival good. Roma took three key elements in his model, namely externalities, increasing returns in the production of output and diminishing returns in the production of new knowledge. According to Romer, it is spill over from research efforts by a firm that leads to the creation of new knowledge by other firms. In other words, new research technology by a firm spill over instantly across the entire economy. In his model, new knowledge is the ultimate determinant of long-run growth which is determined by investment in research technology. Research technology exhibits diminishing returns which means that investment in research technology will not double knowledge. Moreover, the firm investing in research technology will not be the exclusive beneficiary of the increase in knowledge. 
the other firms also make use of the new knowledge due to the inadequacy of patent protection and thus increase their production. Thus, the production of goods from increased knowledge displays increasing returns and competitive equilibrium is consistent with increasing aggregate returns owning to externalities. Thus, Roma takes investment in research technology as an endogenous factor in terms of the acquisition of new knowledge by rational profit maximization firms. Romer's model of endogenous technical change identifies a research sector specializing in the production of ideas. This sector involves human capital along with the existing stock of knowledge to produce ideas or new knowledge. To Romer, ideas are more important than natural resources. He cited the example of Japan, which has very few natural resources, but it has attained a shift in its economic development or growth with its new creative ideas. It imported machines from the United States during the major era, dismantled them to see how they worked and manufactured their better prototypes. Therefore, Ideas are essential for the growth of an economy. These ideas relate to improved designs for the production of producer durable goods for final production. In the Roma model, new knowledge enters into the production process in three ways. First, a new design is used in the intermediate goods sector for the production of a new intermediate input. Second, in the final sector, labor, human capital and available producers durable produce the final product. Third, and a new design increases the total stock of knowledge which increases the productivity of human capital employed in the research sector. In the Roma model, new knowledge enters into the production process in three ways. First, a new design is used in the intermediate goods sector for the production of a new intermediate input. Second, in the final sector, labor, human capital and available producers durables produce the final product. Third, a new design increases the total stock of knowledge which increases the productivity of human capital employed in the research sector. So friends, let us now discuss assumptions to this model. The Roma model is based on the following assumptions. Firstly, economic growth comes from technological change. Second, technological change is endogenous. Third, market incentives plays an important role in making technological changes available to the economy. Fourth, Invention of a new design requires a specified amount of human capital. Fifth, the aggregate supply of human capital is fixed. Sixth, knowledge or a new design is assumed to be partially excludable and retainable by the firm which invented the new design. It means that if an inventor has a patented design for a machine, no one can make or sell it without the agreement of the inventor. On the other hand, other inventors are free to spend time to study the patented design for the machine and acquire knowledge that helps in the design of such a machine. Thus, patents provide incentives to firms to engage in research and development and other firms can also benefit from such knowledge. When there is a partial excludability, investment in research and development leading to an invention by a firm can only bring in quasi rent. Seventh, technology is a non-rival. It is used by one firm, does not prevent it use by another. Eighth, 
The new design can be used by firms and in different periods without additional costs and without reducing the value of the input. Ninth, it is also assumed that the low cost of using an existing design reduces the cost of creating new designs. Lastly, when firms make investment on research and development and invent a new design, there are externalities that are internalized by private agreements. Friends, let us now understand the model. Given these assumptions, the Roma model can be explained in terms of the following technological production function as shown wherein change in A is equals to the function of capital, human capital and existing technology. Where change in A is the increasing technology, K with subscript A is the amount of capital invested in producing the new design or technology, H with subscript A is the amount of human capital that is labor employed in research and development of new design, A is the existing technology of design and F is the production function for the technology. The production function shows that technology is endogenous when more human capital is employed for research and development of new designs, then technology increases by larger amount that is A is greater. If more capital is invested in research laboratories and equipment to invent the new design, then technology also increases by a larger amount that is change in A is more. Further, the existing technology that is A also leads to the production of new technology. Since it is assumed that technology is a non-rival input and partially excludable, there are positive spillover effects of technology which can be used by other firms. Thus, the production of new technology such as knowledge or idea can be increased through the use of physical capital, human capital and existing technology. So friends, now let us critically evaluate endogenous growth theory. Despite the fact that the new growth theory has been regarded as an improvement over the new classical growth theory, still it has many critics. Firstly, according to Scott and Orbeck, the main ideas of the new growth theory can be traced to Adam Smith and increasing returns to Marx analysis. Secondly, Srinivasan does not find anything new in the new growth theory because increasing returns and endogeneity of variables have been taken from the neoclassical and Calder's models. Thirdly, Fisher criticizes the new growth theory for depending only on the production function and the steady state. Fourthly, to Olson, the new growth theory lays too much emphasizes on the role of human capital and neglects the role of institutions. Fifthly, in the various models of new growth theory, the difference between physical capital and human capital is not clear. For instance, in Romer's model, capital goods are the key to economic growth. He assumes that human capital accumulates and when it is embodied in physical capital, then it becomes a driving force. But he does not clarify which is the driving force. Lastly, by using secondary school enrollment as a proxy for human capital, in their model, Manqui, Roma, and Wheel find that physical and human capital accumulation cannot lead to perpetual economic growth. Summarizing today's session, in today's session, we learnt about the endogenous growth theory in detail and policies to increase rate of savings and productivity. Finally, we critically evaluated the growth theory. Thank you.